Right to our top story for Thursday morning. Robert Jenrick has quit overnight as immigration minister, saying that the government's emergency Rwanda legislation does not go far enough. In his resignation letter to the Prime Minister, Mr Jenrick said, <clears throat> I'm unable to take the currently proposed legislation through the Commons as I do not believe it provides us with the best possible chance of success. Delighted to say Jonas from the studio. First thing this morning, top man as well in his Red Sox, former Conservative <laughs> advisor Charlie Rowley. Um, I, to me, it was a little bit petulant. Uh, to me, it was a little bit predictable because I think he was a bit miffed he didn't get a bigger job last time. But to me... This, opened the door. this opens the door to exactly what the Tories always do. They're about to implode, mate, aren't they? Uh, well, I, I hope not. I don't think so. But, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see throughout the course of the day. But it was sad to see Rob go. He's been a huge supporter of the Prime Minister. They've been personal friends for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Rob was very uh, supportive of, of, of Rishi, getting him into number 10 in the first place. So, clearly, he's just felt that after carrying through the immigration uh, issues that the country's face under Suella uh, uh, as Home Secretary, then having a change of Home Secretary, he obviously felt that the plan uh, that was put forward yesterday just didn't go far enough. And on a point of principle, he felt as though he had to resign. Can you kind of put in, in layman's terms what he wanted the plan to do and why it didn't go far enough, in his opinion? So, effectively, the new emergency legislation that came forward, uh, announced by James Cleverley yesterday, uh, talks about making sure that uh, the Parliament is sovereign, so that Rwanda, in legislation, is a safe country, so you can get that scheme up and running. That is something that the courts should adhere to, and it shouldn't be a blocker in any way. The new uh, legislation that comes forward um, uh, 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 overrides parts of human rights law, it overrides parts of uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. What it doesn't do is ignore totally the European uh, Convention of Human Rights, which might still then, some would argue, as Suella uh, was arguing and as what Robert Jemrick was arguing, that there might still then be more uh, challenges in the cause. And it doesn't go far enough, according to Suella and, and Robert, that if you are going to be deported to Rwanda, or if you're at risk of being deported to Rwanda, as an individual, you could still appeal that decision, and therefore uh, uh, it, you, you wouldn't achieve the results that the government wants to, which is to deport people to Rwanda and stop the boats. So there is just uh, still a conversation to be had as to whether the emergency legislation goes far enough. The government will say that it does. But time will tell. You, you yeah. talk about layman's terms. I think Nick's right, and forgive me, I'm not. You know, you, you you know far more about this than I do. But it's it's it becomes increasingly obvious that he's hanging his hat on something that not even his own team believe in. And I've been very uh, from day one. Right? I want immigration sorted out. I don't want 170,000 people stuck in a queue. I think it's disgraceful for us as a country. But 500 to Rwanda. I read every night. Oh well, I tell you what, it'll be. It'll be a deterrent. Yeah, I, I stop in the boats. You're not going. I, I genuinely, I, to me, Sunak is in a position now where he's nowhere to turn because he's pinned his hat on this. If you're Home Secretary and your Immigration Minister, who are behind this, say this isn't good enough, and you're spending your time trying to balance between the right of the party you want more and the left who don't, they're going to imply. I, honestly, Charlie, they've done this before. And it's um, a, a sticky wicket, you know, you know, the party has to come together to get behind successive Tory mm -hmm. manifestos where it's pledged to cut immigration down, legal and uh, uh, illegal immigration, cutting migration legally down from the uh, hundreds of thousands under David Cameron to the tens of thousands. That was his first pledge in, in 2015. And now it's at 750 or 1.2 million. And, and I think there has to be a, a definitely a wider conversation about those figures in mm -hmm. terms of the legal migration because the a number of those, the large number of those are students. Now, you have to have a conversation about is it right to include students in these figures? A number of those are healthcare workers as well. At a time after COVID, you need more healthcare workers, particularly in adult social care. I think that's a very different conversation you can have on the doorstep with people. But certainly when it comes to illegal migration and stopping the boats, it's absolutely right that you can have a policy, a deterrent in place such as Rwanda, where, yes, of course, you know, the numbers of people that are crossing the channel, uh, uh, there aren't enough places in Rwanda to deport them all, but you will see it as a deterrent Overall, the numbers of people that will make that crossing in the first place come down because it will be sending a very clear signal that if you come into this country illegally, you won't be able to yeah. stay. It's busting those criminal gangs that we see in France and working with countries like Albania to deport, uh, where there's 90% uh, return rates, working sure. with Turkey, with, working but, but with Belgium, I'm, I'm working with Italy. I'm going to take you up on that. I, I read yesterday about the Albanian ad agreement, right? Because we know that, I think a couple of years ago, the highest incidence of fit, male foreign criminals were Albanians. Why don't they, instead of hanging their hat on this, go and make some agreements with other countries, return agreements? Wouldn't that be time better spent or money better spent? It just annoys me. Yeah, I know. I think that's right. And I think those are agreements um, uh, are either being worked on and there are some that are in place. But I think the fact that we might not know about them enough or we're not yeah. talking about that enough. Maybe you're right. I mean, sure. Robert Jenrick's letter, you know, for, for despite his resignation, he was 
um, uh, talking about all the achievements that have happened in this particular area, and some of them were quite a surprise to me because, yeah. you know, uh, we're not hearing about Focus it enough. Focus has been so much in Rwanda. It, it, exactly. So I think the government needs to get on the front foot and say, actually, look, uh, to both sides of the party, as you were rightly saying, Germany, where there is the divide, look, mm. you know, we can uphold international law, we can uh, be... Uh, uh, Britain's best in, in playing our part in the, in the international community, as well as taking a tough line on immigration, which is what people want in this country. But you spoke about clear signals earlier. In order for any deterrent to work, it has to be, it has to signal clearly to criminal gangs that it will work. Uh, and even yesterday, a representative from Rwanda said, we will pull out of this agreement if we fear that it will break international law. It's not going to happen, is it? Well, and, and, and I think that's why we've got to make sure that this legislation that's coming forward, and there's, uh, you know, uh, the Prime Minister's response to uh, Robert Jemrick said that he thought that there was a fundamental misunderstanding. Yeah, she said he thought his, his, his immigration minister didn't understand the policy. I mean, I'm listen, everybody knows probably where I sit, but you've got to look at this and go, seriously? You've got nine months left in that job. And now I question, I was going to put this to you because you know far more of politics than I do. All of these people who are now standing up and grandstanding and resigning and, and doing it, are they doing it because they're making a pitch? Are they doing it so that their constituents say they've stood by some honour and they've got a chance of being elected? Or are they putting their name in lights because they know it's history and they want to make a bit of money elsewhere? I'm being serious. Well, I th it could be a combination of all, all three. three yeah. I mean, yeah. there, there will be those who, yeah. you know, it, it's no secret. I think Suella Brahman has leadership ambitions. She stood before. Um, uh, she's uh, very passionate about this particular yeah. area, and she made some very uh, uh, choice words yesterday um, on, on, on the topic of the Conservative Party. Sat with Liz Truss, I saw. And, um, uh, you know, it, so she perhaps has a, a particular uh, motive, but I don't think it takes away the seriousness of the topic. But there will be people, yes, you're absolutely right, who are MPs and constituencies who think that this really is a fundamental problem. And if you are a Conservative MP, when the polls are looking uh, a little bit shaky, I'm sure it can be pulled back. They will narrow. Um, but uh, you're right, it will be a very, very nervous time for, for a lot of Tory MPs. Well, do you think that this could mean we would see an earlier election mm. than November, uh, you know, autumn next year? Could it be spring? Could it be even sooner? Uh, uh, <laughs> Look is, at the that, face. That, that, that is the uh, only the prime minister will know when, when the right times to go. But, but the, uh, the feeling of it—it it mm. certainly feels like. Why would you that go election, early? Well, Why would you go early? Doesn't he need every week to try and create a bit of success? Am I missing the point there? And well, it, it just depends on whether he loses. There could potentially be a. a vote of no confidence in him, things could be brought forward. The, the, you're, you're absolutely... I mean, there'll be two... You know, the, the longer it goes on, you know, can it get any worse, you know, in terms of the, the Tory party and its divisions? But okay. the ultimately, can you hang on as long as possible to make sure other things that are taking place that, you know, like the economy... Take we need you in the Tory okay, party <laughs> because you, at least you've got a smile on your face. They all look so miserable, it, mate. It's only because I'm here with you two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quarter past six, let's move on. A Covid inquiry yesterday. Mm. Boris Johnson... Uh, slunk in at seven o'clock. I, I again uh, made my feelings quite well known yesterday. I, I don't think, uh, unfortunately, uh, my annoyance about how the trust that he was given has disappeared with Partygate, and we're going to have a victim later, of a bereaved family's victim. I, I just, um, I, my frustration is that this is just turning into, you know, he said, she said. But at the end of the day, it's 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 right that the country question him, isn't it? I think that's absolutely right. And I think that Boris did um, uh, very well yesterday, actually. It was a calm performance. It was... Um, uh, did a haircut quite again. <laughs> um, it was uh, 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 very controlled. But he had clearly had a lot of time to reflect mm. and think about things and, and being open and honest about saying, well, you can be presented with all the data, you can have your... Are you going to uh, say open and honest? Do you think everybody has uh, interpreted... It's a daily star, Nicola. <laughs> hey, I'm <laughs> daily star. Not everybody interpreted him as being open and honest. Uh, and, and you... you I swear to... Me. There'll be papers that take that view about Boris, I think, any day of the week. But at least he was sort of able to say, look, you know, he didn't twig some of the data early enough. He got the... Could... He, did you see that? He got the KC on one point when the KC said you've got the highest rates of death in the Western world and he shot straight back. To me, he looked as if he was over the detail. But, of course, the optics of what happened, the, 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 the chaos that we now know ensued in 10 Downing Street, stops with the main man, doesn't it? It, it does. And he, look, even though he said, look, some of the WhatsApp messages and some of the language that we've seen in those WhatsApp messages is uh, way below the standard that's expected of anybody in public life. Uh, he said he wasn't uh, aware of all of that. He understood that you're working with very difficult people who've got egos sure. and competing priorities, but that uh, overall 
um, enhances decision making because you have such extreme views on both sides and you can cover all bases in order to make sure that you make an informed decision. But um, he does take responsibility for, 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 for all of the people that he employed, for the culture, for the decisions that were made. Um, and he um, apologised yesterday and that was the right thing to do. How did you think he did yesterday? Didn't see enough in detail. Um, saw him sort of throw his head down when those people shouted out at the beginning. Um, uh, I think he looked defeated and broken, if you want me to be honest. If yeah, I look at it. It, he seemed like a different Boris Johnson. There, there uh, was... People will argue otherwise, but... No, no, no. I, I, I would have told you six months ago, I think he was coming back. I think he's finished now. I, I, I absolutely accept that. But what I... Yeah. What I will not accept ever, I'm sure there were many mistakes, and if you're the main man, you should take responsibility. His biggest mistake was employing Dominic Cummings, but Don, Dominic Cummings got him in there. Maybe there was a naivety. I still will sit until the end of my day and say, it doesn't justify anything, by the way, that um, we were ill-prepared, uh, as every part of the country and the world, in fact, the world was, and I think anybody would have made those mistakes. I'm not saying Partygate is included in that, but I think what I want from that inquiry, I said it to Nick, all that money and all that time, I want to know how we can stop that happening again. That's, I think, the most important thing, and I think it's time that the tittle-tattle stopped, the blame game stopped, and we found out where it came from and how, if that happens again, we can stop it happening again. That's, do you not agree with that? Um, I think there has to be uh, an element of blame game. There has to be an element of tittle-tattle. Ultimately, the media, you know, yeah, will, yeah. will focus on those bits. You know, we, if you look at the, the wider picture, they are looking into how it happened, why it happened. But for me, for him to say he didn't have a problem with the fact that he didn't attend those five COBRA meetings as Prime Minister, I just thought that was disgraceful, personally. Busy writing his book, according to Charlie Rowling. <laughs> uh, are you going to stand as a Tory MP, Charlie? <laughs> Uh, I, 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 uh, but I don't think... Um, uh, it's now the time. I, 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 I think, um, <laughs> Electoral oblivion, you uh, could rise uh, from the ashes, you'd be the next man. Um, I stood in um, uh, 2019 and that was... Um, I was just Where? on the outskirts of uh, Halton, which is just on the outskirts of, um, of Liverpool. And, just, and I, I don't know why I didn't win in Liverpool um, as a Tory MP. Uh, but, um, How many uh, votes did you get? Uh, I pulled over 10,000 10, votes. Good so, um, Which I thought was, I think was I, quite listen, nice. But, um, it's nice to talk to somebody with political ambitions who's got a smile on his face and a spring in his step. Charlie Rowley, always a pleasure. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, my you friend. so much, Charlie.